My name is David Siegel. In 1991, I wrote a book about climate change, explaining how the greenhouse effect worked and why we have to reduce CO2 emissions, because adding CO2 to the atmosphere would eventually change the climate. Since then, I've done more research, and I've changed my mind. Another person I believe is also rational and willing to look at the facts is Bill Gates who's currently saving the world by helping develop a vaccine for the coronavirus, but he's also writing a book on climate. Bill Gates knows a lot about data. In 1999, Gates looked at these numbers from North Carolina schools and decided that small schools produced better students, or at least better test scores. So he used $2 billion of his own money and spent the next five years chopping larger schools into smaller schools and supporting small schools, until he announced that it hadn't worked and that he had actually confused small sample variants for signal. In this video, I'm going to show a lot of data related to climate, and I'll let you draw your own conclusions. We'll have to be on the watch for cognitive biases like base rate neglect, cherry picking, undercounting, confirmation bias, anecdotal reasoning, and more. For the next hour, I'll present data from each of these areas. I'll check them against the UN claims in their most recent report, and we'll try to answer the question, are CO2 emissions really driving climate? Let's start with temperature. At least twice in the last billion years, the Earth was a ball of ice from pole to pole. The oceans froze over. Each of these periods lasted about 10 million years. In the last 600 million years, the Earth has been mostly free of ice at the poles. In fact, permanent ice at both poles has occurred less than 10% of the time. Here's what we know about CO2 during this period. What's the trend? What are the drivers? It's hard to see any correlation here. Notice that CO2 was as high as 7,000 parts per million during the Cambrian period, when there was an explosion of plant and animal life. This may not be accurate, but it is the best data we have. Let's zoom in. Looking at the last 400,000 years, we see a distinct cycle driven by the sun. The Earth's distance from the sun and its angle of rotation create so-called Milankovitch cycles of cooling and warming. For the last 400,000 years, we've technically been in an ice age, with ice at both poles year-round. Now let's add carbon dioxide. This data comes from ice cores. If you look closely, you'll see that CO2 usually follows temperature. There's a lag of between 100 and 800 years, which you can see by noticing that the gray lines are usually a bit to the right of the red lines. The simplest explanation is that CO2 is not the cause, but rather the effect of warming. Now, there are more complicated explanations, but the simplest one is often the best. 20,000 years ago, New York City was under a kilometer of ice. Since the end of that ice age, there was a cold period at around 13,000 years called the Younger Dryas, and then something interesting happened. Climate has been remarkably stable, all by itself, for about 10,000 years. It should be clear that humans have had nothing to do with this. Now again, let's add CO2. And once again, we see the time lag. It's very difficult to see CO2 as the driver of climate. In the last thousand years, all the data point to a pronounced warming period in the Middle Ages, when Greenland was inhabited and farmed, followed by an ice age when the Thames River was frozen over during winters and Greenland was abandoned. The Little Ice Age continued until about 1800 when temperatures started going up. Looking at CO2, is CO2 driving temperatures? Let's zoom in again. Because of the European wars, the best historical thermometer data comes from the United States Historical Climate Network, which we use as a proxy for the Northern Hemisphere. I want to take a minute to break this chart down into four separate periods. A hot period, 
the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, during which there were extended heat waves and droughts. The next 30 years were cooler, and there was talk of global cooling. The New York Times reported many times that scientists agree the world is getting colder. Then another 30 years of increasing temperature, including a serious El Nino in 1988, and then the big one in 1998. And that performance hasn't been repeated. For the past 20 years, despite another El Nino in 2014 that drove the press to claim the sky is falling, the average temperature in the U.S. hasn't risen much at all. Not one of Al Gore's predictions has come true. In the last 100 years, U.S. average temperature has increased less than one degree. Yet in 2006, Al Gore predicted within the decade there will be no more snows of Kilimanjaro. Well, this is how Mount Kilimanjaro looks today. Some of the ice on the Kibo summit is still 40 meters thick. Al Gore made his predictions based on photos taken by his friends. Let's look at the data instead. Kilimanjaro summits have lost a lot of ice in the past 100 years. Researchers Philip Mote and George Kaiser explain that the loss has nothing to do with temperature because the temperature on the summit hasn't changed. Rather, it has to do with less rainfall since the late 1800s. Most of the decline happened before 1950. It's still possible that the snow on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro will disappear, but the fate of most tropical glaciers is determined by precipitation, not by temperature. Back to North America. Let's add CO2. Now, we know CO2 has increased during this period from 280 parts per million to 400 parts per million. If that's driving temperatures, we should see an upward curve in temperatures over the past 50 years. In this time period, we have accurate satellite measurements, so we can look at the global picture again. This much more accurate record shows a long-term rise of about one-tenth of one degree centigrade per decade for the past five decades. Very much the same pattern we've seen for the previous 150 years. Plenty of variance and a steady increase of one degree Celsius per century. It's tempting to think that CO2 is driving temperatures up, and it may actually have some effect. But in reality, it may just be driving thermometers up. Let's look at how we measure temperature. For the period 1880 to 1980, the United States had the best temperature record in the world using calibrated thermometers and logbooks. Europe went through two wars, so they don't have much continuous data, and the rest of the world didn't have reliable measurement. There are 8,000 weather stations in the United States, and 1,200 of them are special. These are the members of the U.S. Historical Climate Network a group of stations that have been producing consistent temperature readings for more than a hundred years. It's boring work, but it's important, and I want to show you some of those stations. Here's the station in Orland, California. It's still far away from any heat sources. Its average temperature readings show very hot years during the Civil War, two hot decades in the 20s and 30s, a general cooling trend, and then some recent warming. This thermometer used to be out in a field until they built an airport around it. Do you suppose it reads hotter than it did a hundred years ago? This one hasn't moved in over 100 years. This one was in a field until they decided to put a building on top of it, so they took it upstairs to the roof near the heating and air conditioning exhaust. This one had a firehouse built around it, and its temperature record shows rising numbers starting around 1980. Hmm, how old does that building look? This is called the heat island effect. Temperatures haven't actually risen, but thermometer readings have. Out of 1,200 stations that began recording before 1900, only 13% are rated one or two, shown here as blue and green diamonds which means they are providing consistent data. The rest have been significantly compromised. How does that affect the U.S. average temperature? Well, we don't 
measure average temperature. There's no such thing as an average temperature thermometer. We measure the maximum and minimum each day. If you look at the unadjusted data, you'll see that the maxima have come way down since their peak in the 1930s. There's been a general decline in peak temperatures for the last 100 years. But unadjusted nighttime temperatures have risen. How could that be? Because most thermometers are now in urban neighborhoods with plenty of asphalt, brick, and steel. These structures absorb heat during the day and radiate it at night. Only weather stations that are still isolated show the cooling trend, while the rest are reading hotter and hotter. So the warming here is a warming of urban thermometers, not the warming of the climate. Now look, please pay attention. This graph and the next graph are going to show two different ways to look at the average temperatures. This one is NOAA's graph of extremes, which is a single number for each year calculating the temperatures either significantly above or significantly below normal. Seen this way, it looks like the last few decades have been getting warmer and warmer. But if we just look at hot days, not some peak temperature out of the year, we see a different picture. This data comes from the same sources, but now we see the number of days above 90 degrees, shown in blue, 95 degrees, shown in red, and 100 degrees, shown in yellow. The number of hot days represents the climate much better than a peak measurement from each year. The 1930s really were hotter. The general trend is down, and Tony Heller has verified this by correlating this data with stories from newspapers in each of those years. Looking outside the U.S., Iceland has decent records because they weren't involved in the wars. Here is 200 years of continuous records from a remote site that hasn't been compromised. It shows an increase of less than one degree centigrade per century. I don't see any hockey stick shape here in Iceland. Do you? Let's go back and try to establish the best possible temperature graph for the last century. In 1999, NASA and the UN published a graph that looked like this red one, showing average raw data from the U.S. Historical Climate Network. And then they said, hold on, we have to adjust our data. They adjusted their data several times, publishing new graphs every few years. And they now claim this blue graph is the truth. They cooled the past and warmed the last 15 years. Remarkably, the difference between these two graphs exactly matches the increase of CO2 in the same period. Coincidence? You know, I don't think either of these graphs represents reality. I think NASA has adjusted their data to match the narrative of global warming. But I don't think the red graph represents reality either. If 87% of these stations have been compromised, then this graph has to be reading too hot. That makes NASA's graph, which cooled the past and warmed the last 15 years, even more wrong. To me, that says NASA is in the storytelling business, not in the science business. So I've looked for a graph that corrects the raw data for the heat island effect. I've asked around, and no one has it. So I've created an estimate by adjusting the temperature down, starting in the 1960s, to account for the hot readings from the compromised station. This may not be right, but whatever the true temperature history is, it must be cooler than the average of the historical stations. It can't be hotter. You may want to pause here and look at these three graphs to understand them. Red is the average of the raw temperatures. Black is constructed to estimate throwing out compromise data from the hot stations, while NASA's graph has evolved over time to become this fictional blue line. Keep these tricks in mind whenever you hear hottest year on record. Arctic sea ice extent isn't very important because the ice loses two-thirds of its area from March to September each year, an area the size of the United States, so the variance is tremendous. The Arctic Ocean is two miles deep, with just a thin crust of ice on top, averaging two meters thick. But let's look at what we know about sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. Here's a picture of ice at the North Pole in March 2020. It's very close to the median for this time of year, well within natural variance. But sea ice extent doesn't really tell us much. Sea ice volume tells us more. Here we see winds pushing ice away from Russia, shown in blue, and packing the ice toward Canada, where it gets thicker, shown in red. 
Looking at the colored lines in the inset graph, we can see that sea ice volume is down this year and for the last several years in general. We've been using satellites to measure sea ice extent for 40 years now. Sea ice is declining. But what about before 1978? Two researchers have studied this. The first is Konstantin Vinikov, who used declassified Russian records to reconstruct the past coverage of sea ice. This graph is practically the inverse of the temperature graph we've seen before. The second is Florence Federer, who reconstructed Arctic sea ice extent using many different sources of data, including ship logs, old photos, books, etc. The blue line shows that the permanent ice hasn't declined much. The red line shows the drop in sea ice extent satellites have measured, but it doesn't show any significant change to summer sea ice in the 1920s and 30s, when we know temperatures then were much higher. So I asked Federer if she had used newspaper accounts, and she said she hadn't. Tony Heller has a series of videos on YouTube where he uses newspaper clippings like these to show that the first half of the 20th century was very warm around the world. Here, the New York Times reports in 1958 that the ice pack was 40% thinner and 12% smaller than at the beginning of the century. There are many similar stories reported in Scandinavian newspapers. You know, it helps to have this kind of perspective rather than just looking at the last 50 years or so. Let's check the thermometers. Here are the recorded temperatures for several isolated stations around the Arctic Circle. And remember, isolated stations have the best data. Almost all of them show the same warm 30s and 40s, the same downtrend for the 50s and 60s, and then a gradual warming from there. As temperatures have risen slowly, Arctic sea ice is declining slowly and probably has been for the past 200 years. So what? Remember that 7,000 years ago, the Arctic was ice-free in summer. I'm willing to believe that there's less sea ice now than there was 40 years ago, but I don't think it means much. Because the ice is floating, a loss of sea ice doesn't raise sea levels. It just comes and goes in cycles that probably have nothing to do with carbon dioxide. Now, for ice that isn't floating, let's look at Greenland. According to Tony Heller, Greenland has about 3,000 trillion tons of ice and snow. Much of the ice is about two miles thick. So when we hear that Greenland loses billions of tons of ice in a single day, should we be concerned? Let's try to put some context around these numbers. From September to the peak in May, around five to 600 billion tons of snow falls on Greenland. Then it melts for a few months, losing some of the snow that has fallen. On average, Greenland gains about 400 billion tons of ice every year, more than a billion tons of ice per day. And then billions of tons of ice get pushed out to sea by the weight of glaciers coming down the valleys. In this way, Greenland has maintained its two-mile ice cover for thousands of years. Let's look at some recent years. 2012 was an exceptional year in which more ice had melted by, than usual, quite a bit more. 2013 was also a warm year, and the next three years were essentially average. In 2017, much more snow fell than usual. In 2018, much less ice melted than usual. Over those two years, Greenland had a net gain of over a trillion tons of ice. I'm going to repeat that. In two recent years, Greenland had a net gain of over one trillion tons of ice. Every one of these years shows a net increase in Greenland ice. This is offset by calving at the shoreline which is caused by the pressure of ice coming down and has nothing to do with temperature. Tony Heller has an important video on Greenland that I recommend you see. This graph of temperature comes from the Tasselak station, which has 120 uninterrupted years of continuous temperature measurement from a remote thermometer. But NASA and the UN don't show the whole thing. Their graphs always start around 1980 and show a strong warming trend in the Arctic. That's what they feed to the media. They know very well what the previous temperatures have been in Greenland, but they don't show the inconvenient data. Is Greenland losing ice overall? From 1992 to 2018, the ice sheet lost 3.8 billion tons of ice, 
as a result of more calving than accumulation. Out of 3 million billion tons of ice, that's a rounding error. There were probably similar losses back in the 1920s and 30s. But hey, if we assume this trend continues, oh, we're talking about 200 billion tons of ice lost every single year. And at that rate, it would take 15,000 years to lose all the ice in Greenland, which would raise sea level very, very slowly. Now let's head south to Antarctica is the largest source of fresh water on Earth. Most of it is locked up in glaciers, and some of it is floating in the sea. In 2015, NASA reported that the Antarctic ice sheet had a net gain of 112 billion tons of ice a year from 92 to 2001, and a net gain of 82 billion tons of ice per year from 2003 to 2008. This image shows NASA's summary of the entire 20th century, showing much more accumulation of ice and snow, shown in blue, than loss, shown in red. NASA said that? Don't worry, they covered their tracks. In their press release, they said, Additional scrutiny and follow-up research will be required before this study can be reconciled with the preponderance of evidence supporting the widely accepted model of a shrinking Antarctic ice sheet. Well, let's see what we can figure out. Satellite measurements show a slight cooling trend since 1979 when two separate satellites began measuring temperature. Because the average temperature at the South Pole is minus 49 degrees Celsius, you might hear about a warm day in January once in a while, but you may not hear about the coldest days in August. Satellites provide the best data. Antarctica is not warming. Here's a reconstruction of Antarctica's average temperature from ice cores. Temperatures go up and down. If you want to announce that Antarctica is warming, just start your graph in 1950. Just show that to the public and not the information from before. But look at the vertical axis. The total variance is just one degree centigrade over the past 200 years. And that's the variance. There is no trend. This image of sea ice extent is from April 2020. Now the sea ice extent is roughly where it has been for the last 40 years. It's well within the normal range. But sea ice doesn't matter, and here's why. The press often shows dramatic pictures of ice calving from glaciers, splashing into the ocean. They tell us it's because temperatures are rising. That's not what's happening. A glacier starts a snowfall high in the mountains and makes its way over thousands of years to the sea. You're looking at the end of a conveyor belt driven from far away as more snow slides into the valley from above. What causes the ice to fall into the water is pushing. When you see active calving, that's the result of the entire glacier flowing from mountains to the sea. The more weight building up on the glacier, the faster it moves downhill, the more activity you see at the edge, and then also goes for the large ice sheets that are floating beyond. Calving today is the end of a long journey for a river of ice as the ice naturally tumbles into the sea. This is from an ice core studying how the ice in Antarctica has grown and shrunk over the past 800 years. Images of glaciers breaking off to the sea helped Al Gore sell his movie and get a Nobel Prize, but a look at the data shows that Antarctica doing the same thing it always has for thousands and probably millions of years. Sensational stories of Antarctica melting and disappearing are a case of base rate neglect and cherry picking the start point. It's hard to judge what the press feeds us without the proper context. Between the poles, there are about 200,000 glaciers in the world. Remembering that the Earth has been warming gradually for 200 years, we should see most of these glaciers retreating naturally, but slowly. That would be our background rate assumption, right? Now here's Glacier Bay in Alaska. Note how much the glacier grew during the Little Ice Age to 1750, and it started shrinking around 1800, and by the end of the 19th century, it had largely disappeared. We can probably assume that most glaciers in Alaska had been shrinking for about 200 years as the world is gradually warming. But in Greenland, the Jacobshaven Glacier has been growing since the mid-1800s. Why? Ice mass is a function of both precipitation and temperature. While the Alaskan glaciers are probably shrinking as a result of higher temperatures, the growth of this glacier is likely to be a result of more precipitation higher up. This remarkable graph assembled by the UN shows over 30,000 glacier length measurements by region. 
Red shows glaciers getting shorter. Blue shows glaciers getting longer. Look at the worldwide data at the bottom. It looks like glaciers have been retreating steadily since the end of the last ice age, as the Earth has been gradually warming. I put in a vertical line at around the time when CO2 started accelerating. Do you see a corresponding accelerating loss of ice to match the trend in CO2? This paragraph from the UN report confirms what I've been saying all along. Gradual warming for 200 years with hot years in the 30s, cooling in the 60s and 70s, and resume modest warming since. It's starting to get repetitive, I know. A recent study of over 19,000 glaciers shows the picture visually. The losses we see in the Alps and New Zealand are more or less expected as a result of the background rate. Those glaciers started shrinking in the early 1800s. Even though the Earth is gradually warming, Himalayan glaciers are stable. Well, that's the result of increased precipitation in recent decades. Glaciers in Alaska and the Andes have lost the most. Is this a trend? What causes it? Could the explanation be natural regional variants over century timescales? How do we know what glaciers were like thousands of years ago anyway? In 1991, two hikers discovered the frozen body of a 5,000-year-old man at an altitude of 10,000 feet in the Austrian Alps. The body emerged after glaciers retreated. The press says this is a graphic illustration of climate change. How did he get there in the first place? 5,000 years ago, there was no glacier there. Again, we have a case of base rate neglect. Glaciers are dynamic. They come and go naturally as the climate varies on a scale of centuries. Don't accept stories as proof of anything. Precipitation. Does carbon dioxide have any influence on snow and rain? Let's find out. Rutgers Global Snow Lab has been keeping track of snow extent in the northern hemisphere. This graph shows increasing snow in the fall months. In winter, we see increasing snow extent, which is a measure of how far south snow falls. This is a graph most climate skeptics use to make their points. And this spring graph is the one most climate alarmists use to show less and less snow. Are these trends or cycles? Well, let's go back 80 years. In Colorado, we see no particular change in snow. In fact, in Colorado, the amount of snowpack in May is down, but in June, it's up. Pretty difficult to say there's a clear trend here or that something is driving it. In the Sierras, no particular trend over 140 years. Since 1900, the U.S. is getting wetter. There are fewer droughts in the past 50 years than in the previous 50 is carbon dioxide driving more precipitation? Here's Australia. Australia has also been getting wetter. It was drier during the first half of the 20th century, and CO2 wasn't the cause then. It's hard to say we can see a definite trend here. I would bet it was slightly drier back in the 1800. Here we see about all the data we have for the world going back to 1880. This represents 15 data sets. It's far from perfect information, but you can see that the general trend on precipitation is flat. No hockey sticks of rain or drought. Let's look at sea level. We hear a lot about rising sea levels. What would drive sea level isn't sea ice melting. It would be land ice melting into the oceans. We've already seen that Greenland isn't losing ice appreciably. Antarctica is gaining ice, and the rest of the glaciers are losing and gaining ice at different rates. Is there any impact of CO2 on sea level? Not surprisingly, sea level has been rising steadily since 20,000 years ago when New York City was buried under a kilometer of ice. Sea level has gone up 130 meters, more than 400 feet. About 7,000 years ago, when the North Pole was ice-free in summer, sea level was probably higher than it is today. Sea level changes, but gradually. To see that, let's look at some data from tide gauges around the world. Now, New York City has been keeping track of sea level since 1855, with a timeout for the Civil War. The trend is linear. Sea level at this location has risen about 28 centimeters, or 11 inches, in the past 100 years. There's no curve upward in the last 50 years, as most news reports would have us believe.
we see the same exact pattern we would see from gradual consistent warming beginning in the early 1800s. Virginia Key, a tide gauge in Miami, has seen 28 centimeters or 11 inches in the past 100 years. Now we know that the land is sinking there at least 20 centimeters per century, mostly due to groundwater pumping, leaving around 8 centimeters of actual sea level rise over the last century, which photos of Miami Beach confirm. San Diego, 22 centimeters or 9 inches in 100 years. Honolulu, 15 centimeters or 16 inches in the past 100 years. Again, the trend is linear. Fremantle, Australia, 17 centimeters or 7 inches in 100 years. No acceleration. This station near Tokyo reports 36 centimeters or 16 inches of sea level rise in 100 years. Most of Tokyo dropped 10 meters in the first half of the 20th century as a result of groundwater pumping. They had to stop pumping in 1970 to prevent the land from sinking further. Whoa, Stockholm, Sweden. Sea level has dropped 37 centimeters in 100 years. What's going on? Because the land in Stockholm and its surrounding area is rising as a result of natural plate tectonics. Here's Ketchikan, Alaska, where there's been no change in sea level in the past 100 years. Now, we know that sea level is going up around the world. So in Ketchikan, the land is actually rising at the same rate as the sea, around 16 centimeters per century. Juneau, Alaska is rising faster than Ketchikan is. All of Alaska is rising. Galveston, Texas is sinking dramatically, as is most of the Gulf Coast. Around the world, not only are tectonic plates sliding on top of and below each other, causing land to rise and sink, but most cities are drawing groundwater. In many coastal cities, the land is sinking. Here's Boston, which is similar to New York. According to a study published in Geophysical Research Letters, the east coast from New York to Boston is sinking about 1.5 millimeters per year, or 15 centimeters per century. Now that gives an actual sea level rise of 15 to 20 centimeters, or 6 to 8 inches per century. In my view, this is the most likely true rate of sea level rise for the past 200 years, and UN data actually confirms it. But Judith Curry knows more than I do, and she estimates a true rise of 3 millimeters per year, which would give us 30 centimeters, one foot, over the next century, regardless of how much CO2 goes into the upper atmosphere. So we can establish a 95% confidence interval of between 6 and 12 inches over the next 100 years. Not a single tide gauge in the world shows any acceleration after 1960, when CO2 started to increase. There's another important statistic. Graphic images of future sea level rise sells media, helps nonprofits raise money, and helps governments have more influence and raise their budgets. Everyone can justify raising and spending more money and flying in their private jets to important meetings when the end is just 10 years away, as it always seems to be. Do you think publications exaggerate to increase sales? Speaking of money, let's talk about polar bears. Polar bears are the mascot of climate change. Are they in danger? No matter how you count, bear numbers are up significantly over the past 40 years. This image from the World Wildlife Foundation helps put it in perspective. The red populations are declining and green are increasing. Note that this could simply reflect migration from one zone to another. But here's the important thing. Neither the red nor green areas have very many bears. These zones have the smallest number and therefore the largest variance. They change more on a percentage basis from year to year than the others. These populations don't matter much because most of the bears are in the blue and white areas, which are either stable or uncounted. There are 19 subpopulations of bears over a huge area spanning seven countries, totaling 26,000 to 31,000 bears. Now, polar bears feed exclusively on ring seals. 70% of feeding occurs in the spring, before the ice melts. During summer, seals feed in the open water. This is not a critical feeding time for bears. Just 7,000 years ago, there was no summer ice at all in the Arctic, and bears came through that period just fine. 
The rest of their feeding takes place in the fall, after the fat seals come out of the water onto land and before hibernation. Polar bears live about 25 years and are sexually active from about age 5. Here's what you probably don't know. Hunters kill more than 600 bears every year under a permit system. To put a positive spin on it, they call it conservation hunting. Probably another 200 are poached every year. Hunters take adults who are still in their reproductive years. Hunters kill six to 9,000 adult bears every 10 years. They harvest the equivalent of the entire polar bear population every 30 years. Despite this, polar bear numbers are increasing. Environmental groups use images of polar bears to raise money, but do they care about the bears? Or do they care about the money? It's not the jet flight to Canada that kills these bears. It's hunters getting out of their Humvees and shooting them. Let's look at hurricanes, which are also called tropical cyclones. The United Nations is careful not to predict more hurricanes in the future as a result of adding CO2 to the atmosphere because they know these storms have been decreasing, not increasing. Here we see all hurricane landings in the United States since the late 1880s. Category 5, the strongest storms, are in green. There's a clear trend here. Severe hurricane landings are down since 1960, when CO2 started to rise. This is probably due to natural variance, not any particular cause. In fact, we see the same basic trend worldwide. No measurable increase in tropical cyclones, even though carbon dioxide continues to increase. The United Nations 2018 report on weather extreme states it is likely that the global frequency of tropical cyclones will either decrease or remain essentially unchanged. And then they go on to claim that storms could be more intense and therefore cause more damage. Well, they have to say something that sounds scary. But future damage is guaranteed, even with fewer storms, because humans keep building structures on the coasts in the face of natural variance in the intensity of the storms, and because inflation increases the dollar amount of the damage from one decade to the next. Let's look at fire. Here are the historical figures for fires in the United States. We see a lot of fires in the 40s, and then a spike in the late 70s and early 80s. And then the number of fires drops dramatically from more than 200,000 per year to now maybe 70,000 on average. If you wanted to show that the number of fires were increasing, you'd have to start showing the data from 1983 onward. Keep that date in mind as we go. 1983. Here are the number of acres burned. Remember this next August when the press tells you that CO2 is causing the fires you see on your TV screen. If you wanted to lie with these statistics, you would just show the data from 1983 forward. And that's exactly what the United Nations does. According to this view, both area burned and expenditures are up about four times in 30 years since 1983. Of course, they know the numbers going back in time before this date, so why don't they show them? How much can we trust the United Nations if they're willing to use these tactics? Last year, there was a lot of talk about fires in Australia. The amount of acreage burned was high, but nowhere near the four years with higher numbers. News reports say that preventative burning had been stopped and had even been illegal for the previous several years, so a lot of fuel built up. Authorities later arrested 24 people for arson. Despite Swedish girls crying on TV, do you think CO2 is really responsible? Was it responsible in 1974 as well? Now let's look at ocean temperature. The Earth is two-thirds water, which stores and releases a lot of heat, and that has a big impact on climate. That impact is mostly cyclical. This is the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. As you can see, the temperature of the sea surface rises and falls by about two-tenths of a degree every 60 years or so. That's quite a lot of energy. This has been going on for millions of years and all the creatures in the sea are used to it. These ocean cycles have a big impact on our climate. Matt Makins, a meteorologist in Colorado, shows three ocean temperature cycles that play some role in determining our climate. This one is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the PDO, which is a change in atmospheric temperatures. I'm gonna put my adjusted graph of US temperature behind it just to see if we can learn anything. I'm not using any values for temperature here, just looking for any kind of correlation. Now this is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the ENSO. 
It's responsible for the El Nino and La Nino variations in temperature every 3 to 11 years. Here's the Atlantic Oscillation, the AMO. It looks like this one might have some influence on U.S. air temperatures. Now, I got the idea from Matt to combine all three of these ocean cycles just for fun, and here's the result. This isn't really science, this is just a hunch, but a hunch is something you can test. Some years, the three cycles more or less cancel each other out, while other years they coincide and help create extreme weather events. Well, that's true, but I wouldn't expect full prediction power here, and the West Coast is going to be different from the East. Yet there is some degree of correlation after 1960. There are a lot of variables and a lot of uncertainties. The most important takeaway is that climate is noisy, complex, poorly understood, and impossible to model accurately. Yet a lot of people believe that temperature is being driven by carbon dioxide, which you can see here in pink. That's because NASA and the United Nations use models driven by CO2 to create their projections of future warming. Richard Lindzen of MIT, who helped me with my research, wrote, Future generations will wonder in bemused amazement that the early 21st century's developed world went into hysterical panic over a globally average temperature increase of a few tenths of a degree. And on the basis of gross exaggerations of highly uncertain computer projections combined into implausible chains of inference, proceeded to contemplate a rollback of the industrial age. Next, let's look at ocean acidification. Today, the average ocean pH is 8.1, which means oceans are basic. Acidification doesn't mean lowering pH below 7, which is the threshold for acidic. It just means that oceans are becoming less basic as we add more CO2 to the atmosphere. Is that true? Have ocean waters become less basic in the past 40, 50 years? There's no question that as we add more CO2 to the air, much of it goes into the oceans. That's true. But what happens next? Jim Steele explains, and I will paraphrase, carbon dioxide goes into the water where small animals incorporate it into their shells, which are made of calcium carbonate. Zooplankton pick up the carbon. They either get eaten or they die, and the shells eventually sink to the bottom. There is no such thing as ocean acidification from CO2. Think of CO2 as a fertilizer for marine life. Historically, pH goes up and down over decades. The ocean regulates itself and dumps any extra carbon on the seabed. We don't see a sharp rise in pH over the past 50 years as more CO2 has been added to the oceans. The term ocean acidification was made up to sound scary. It makes no sense to ocean scientists who see it as fertilizer. More CO2 means more shells and more food on the bottom of the food chain. And eventually all that captured carbon settles down onto the seabed. And we know it today as limestone. Limestone is carbon locked up in shells in the same way as trees are carbon locked up in wood, the same way as our bodies are made of carbon. It's a fundamental building block of life. Stories told about ocean acidification sell magazines but have nothing to do with the marine ecosystem. Coral reefs are the subject of many stories of global warming. We hear about and see images of coral bleaching. That's when corals die because the temperature of the water changes too quickly for them to adapt. Now this is the important slide. Bleaching from a temperature rise is a tiny part of what destroys coral reefs. Less than 6% of the cause, and some of that is caused by cooling, not warming, water temperature. The main culprits are the crown of thorns starfish, which eats the corals, and storms, which destroy the ecosystem. More nutrients from sewage and agriculture increase the viability of the starfish, which then consume all the coral. Here we see a reef being destroyed by crown of thorns starfish. Starfish and corals have been fighting it out for millions of years. After the starfish are done, they move on and the reef recovers. Here is 30 years of data from the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Orange bars represent the crown of thorns starfish. Beige bars represent cyclone damage and green is bleaching, both warm and cold. Look for the green bars here. There's only been one significant bleaching event in one part of the reef, and remember bleaching happens in both directions, colder and warmer. Who's to say this hasn't been happening for millions of years? And what happens after a coral reef is destroyed? The answer is, it comes back. There are many species of coral polyps, and they are quite resilient to temperature. If one species isn't able to re-inhabit a reef, the other species moves in and rebuilds the neighborhood. 
This study shows that corals adapt quicker than people expected. As they say in this peer-reviewed paper, and I've highlighted in red, coral adaptation is likely to slow predictions of demise for reef systems, a huge disappointment to the United Nations. Corals are a dynamic ecosystem that change continuously, and bleaching is just one very small part of the cycle they go through as they evolve. As Peter Ridd, an Australian reef expert, says, bleaching is a phenomenon that has only recently been documented, not a phenomenon that has only recently occurred. Temperature oscillations are natural. Bleaching from rising temperatures is rare. A much bigger problem is sewage and pollution. In the next section, I'll summarize by comparing what we've seen to what the United Nations has published. If you've followed me to this point, thank you. You've seen a lot of data. I will summarize by looking at the 12 leading indicators of climate change published by the United Nations Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change in their most recent report of 2018. Let's look at each one. Heating and cooling degree days count how many days we need to add more heat or run our air conditioners more than we did before to make our indoor places comfortable. The UN chart shows we are experiencing more extreme temperatures since the 1970s. But here are the summer maximum temperatures for the U.S. And here's the number of hot days. They've declined dramatically. Wildfire acres burned are only up if you start counting them in 1983. Remember? That's the perfect year to start counting if you want to mislead people. This one, about growing seasons getting longer, is actually true. First, through satellite measurements called leaf indexes, we've seen a tremendous increase in green coverage of the Earth over the past 50 years, and 70% of that is due to more carbon dioxide available to fertilize trees. Both crops and forests have benefited. Second, the growing season has increased more in the West than in the East, probably due to innovations in irrigation in places like California and Arizona, where it's very dry. Look at the UN map. Does it make sense to you that CO2 in the troposphere is causing local effects that respect state boundaries? Is this really an indicator of climate change? There's no such thing as ocean acidification by adding CO2 to the air. All CO2 absorbed by the oceans is available to help zooplankton make their shells. CO2 is fertilizer for them. More fertilizer creates more shells, which then in turn creates other shells and bone and eventually sinks to the bottom, where they get compressed into limestone and chalk. CO2 does not make oceans more acidic. Look down there in the corner at the graph on the lower right. The left axis, the vertical axis, is upside down. It's backwards so they can show ocean acidity rising by going up and to the right. This is a typical tool of propagandists. It's there to convince you. It's done by politicians. It is not done by scientists. Marine species distribution dropping. Hmm. Is that being caused by carbon dioxide? Could there be another explanation? If the UN cared about the health of oceans, they would focus on the fact that humans harvest 100 million sharks each year, and we now consume 20 kilos of fish per person worldwide, almost double the amount per capita from 40 years ago. Is CO2 causing humans to eat more fish? We've seen a linear rise in sea level for the past 200 years. Even the UN's chart right there in blue shows a linear 8 inches of sea level rise in the last century with no acceleration at all. It's right there for everyone to see. Projections of sea level rise have failed to come true, so they keep repeating it, staying on message, claiming it just hasn't started yet. It's 10 years from now. How wrong do the models have to be before we give up on that? Arctic sea ice is down. It's clear that sea ice has declined in recent decades, but it isn't clear that means much. Look at the UN graph here in brown. What's the trend? The UN cites the Palmer Drought Index from 1900. Now here's the exact same data without the weighted average on top. How is a lack of increase in droughts a leading climate change indicator? I'm sure the editors at National Geographic will find some way. As we've seen, snowpack is quite variable. No overall trend in 140 years. It probably depends on ocean currents, not on carbon dioxide.
Now with this one, they have to be careful not to talk about hurricanes or storms because they know those aren't increasing. So they go with heavy precipitation. Both this chart and the drought chart show that the U.S. is getting wetter. And this is caused by too much CO2 in the upper troposphere? Really? Does this look like a trend or like variance to you? If you start looking at heat waves in 1960, if you aggregate the data by decade, and if you squint hard enough, you may see an increasing trend. But heat waves are not the same thing as percent of hot days. And in any case, most of the major heat waves occurred in the late 1800s and the 1930s. Do you think those professional researchers couldn't find any heat wave data before 1960? I guess you could use a single snapshot of one country to show the annual average change in temperature over time, but I'd rather look at the big picture. The Earth has been warming for more than 200 years now at a rate of about 1 degree Celsius per century. I'm looking for hockey stick shapes here, and I haven't seen one yet. Have you? Worldwide, we are using more fossil fuels, and quality of life has gone up tremendously. We've lifted a billion people out of poverty in the last 30 years. Collectively, we are not facing the future of humanity and planet Earth. We are looking deeply down a side hole that is based on politics, misdirection, grandstanding, and public relations, not science. The ends seem to justify any and all means. Environmentalists like me are stunned that we're not paying attention to the things that matter. We're bombarded daily with climate messages. It's impossible to know who's telling the truth and who's lying. And the decarbonization budget now exceeds $1 trillion per year. Forty years of heavy PR has worked, mostly through repetition, trickery, schooling, social engineering, and perverse incentives. Questioning the assumptions is not allowed. People are fired for asking hard questions. Today, most companies are expected to commit to a zero-carbon future. It's not a conversation. It's a hostile takeover. Employees, analysts, and shareholders all insist companies become carbon neutral. This will cost trillions that could be better spent improving the environment and the human condition. My fear is that carbon-based indexes, taxes, and scorecards will make compliance mandatory. It practically already is. Can you imagine if Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, or Tim Cook announced that he had been looking at the data, studying the science, and was starting to question the assumptions around climate change? They can't possibly do it independently, but they could do it together. Around the world, places with more renewables have higher energy prices because solar and wind power still need full backup when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. Systems with batteries that scale are decades away. High energy prices increase the cost of living and the cost of everything hurts lower income people most. Carbon dioxide is not a poisonous gas. It is not pollution. It's coming out of your nose right now. There is no climate crisis. We need a global energy policy based on evidence, science, and cost-benefit analysis, not on myths and rigorous nonsense. If you want to learn my plan for saving the world, I invite you to read about the institute I would like to start. I want more people to develop critical thinking skills and learn to do cost-benefit analysis and use the scientific method to make better decisions and to steer humanity in the right directions. If you can help me start my institute, please contact me. Thank you for watching, liking, and sharing this video.